All right, let's jump into the Word today. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 1 in a moment. The uh, title of the message today is The Style and Subject of Ministry. We're working through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, and the theme kind of of this letter has been and will be uh, becoming a mature church uh, or becoming a mature Christian, which puts some kind of responsibility on us to participate in this work of God in our lives and what God desires to do. Uh, how you do things matter, and uh, how attentive you are to what you're doing matters as well. Uh, uh, there's a story that I heard uh, uh, of a manager of a small factory that took over as the manager and decided, man, he was going to show everybody. He was tired of slackers. He was going to get rid of all the slackers, hiring some new people. And so um, one day he was touring the factory. He noticed that uh, when he kind of got around to the office area that there was a guy just kind of leaning against the wall in the office and and uh, saw him leaning there and walks up to him and says, hey, how much how much do you make every week? And the guy kind of taken back, says, well, almost $400. And so the manager gets in his pocket, pulls out his a billfold, and, and uh, gets out uh, $1,600 in his hand. And in front of all the other employees, he says uh, to the guy, here's four weeks' pay. Now get out and don't come back. And the, the manager's taken back and sheepishly just qu and quickly leaves the building. And, and uh, he watches through the window of the front office there, the factory, as the guy goes, gets in the car, and drives off. And, and then the, the manager turns around, and all the employees are kind of standing there, shocked, just looking at this new manager. What's he going to say? What's he going to do? And, and uh, the manager walks over and says, Now, can anybody tell me what this man that just left did? And somebody in the back of the room says, he's a pizza delivery guy from Domino's. <laughs> um, didn't, didn't know what he was getting into uh, there, that new manager. Um, you remember I've, I've, I've shared uh, about Corinth's culture and the diversity of their culture, religious, ethnic, uh, philosophically. They were an economic hub, a political hub, an educational hub. Uh, they were uh, pretty... Uh, busy and pretty uh, 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 like uh, at their time they were a modern kind of a city as modern as they come and advanced as they come and and the real question is well, how did Paul minister in a place like Corinth Corinth is not Israel Corinth is not Judea Corinth is not Galilee Corinth is a very different kind of a culture and place and how did he minister there now let's jump into the Word so we can find out. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God today? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word today, God. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister, that you would speak to us, Father, and that whatever context we find ourselves in, Lord, may we do ministry the way you've called us to do it, Lord. May we be a blessing as we proclaim the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Corinth uh, was rife with Greek philosophy, and so in fact, last uh, uh, the last chapter, the end of it, he talks about the wisdom of this age and how uh, the, you know there are people who they they're they're looking for something that will tickle their mind. They'll get their mind all all uh, working. And uh, in fact, Greece, Corinth is in the Greek peninsula there, and and Greece is known for its philosophers, people like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and some of these others that that that. Uh, that's what Greece is known for, that, that it's philosophy. These were, there were thinking people here, no doubt. And one of the problems sometimes with intelligence and, and, and philosophies is that we kind of get what's called the ivory tower. It's it kind of aloof, kind of a, there's, there's a tendency sometimes toward pride with, with the, I, my ability to understand and think intellectually and, and those kinds of things. But, but also the concept uh, of uh, uh, this, this uh, ivory tower is being aloof 
aloof and being above some of those kinds of things. It, 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 some of this is a lot like our culture today um, because our culture today is, is kind of in this place where it's, it, it's at least it says, it doesn't, doesn't practically doesn't work out, but at least it says all ideas are equally valid. You know, it's like, hey, what's good for you is good for you and what I think is good for me is what's good for me and those kinds of things. And it's almost like my opinion kind of is, is overarching and is overbearing even of the truth. You know, the, what's, what is reality, what is true, what is the, 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 those things that are concrete don't matter nearly as much as how I feel or how I think about things, what my opinion is about things. But the reality is, not all opinions are valid. Uh, they don't all uh, have equal footing. And uh, despite eloquence or how suave they are when they communicate it or the rhetoric or the, uh, however intelligent sounding they, they might be, and Paul talks about this eloquence, I didn't come to you with words of, of uh, lofty words of eloquence, he says. And I could have came to you like just another philosopher philosophizing in an ivory tower, but I wanted to come with this demonstration of the power of God. Paul's style was different. Listen, the, cult, the, the gospel message always speaks into a cultural context, but it is not bound by that context. In other words, the, the gospel is not bound by the culture that is proclaimed within. The gospel actually is transformational. It changes even the culture. And so there may be long-standing cultural understandings of things, and if they are incorrect, the, go- cult- the gospel moves in and changes the culture. I, th- I think that's important. Because while uh, there are some things that, that culture uh, may affect that don't matter, uh, the uh, styles of of worship there are there are some styles of worship and there are some ways of doing worship that are inappropriate maybe but there's a vast and broad category of style of worship that may not be your preference but it is worship of the Lord nonetheless and so if you go in uh, different different cultures and different different languages when I pastored in Lexington we had we had an African immigrant congregation we had a Hispanic congregation and we had the, the English speaking congregation and all of these had uh, uh, distinct kind of styles, and they were all appropriate, or we wouldn't we wouldn't allow them. Uh, but they were all appropriate. They were all God honoring. They were all part of worship. Now there may have been one style or a couple styles that you might have preferred over the other. But listen, what what Paul is saying is style doesn't trump the truth. Style does not overcome the gospel message, and when it does, it becomes a problem. All right. So what he says is. Uh, I came um, uh, to do some things differently than the philosophers that uh, the Corinthians or the Greek Peninsula is known for. Uh, let me give you these, these few points here. Number one, I think it's important to note Paul's subject matter. He said in verse 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's a lot of talk in the church world today and, and when doing ministry that we've got to understand our culture. And I think that there's there's something to be noted about that, that we understand who we're talking to, whether it be their age level uh, we're, we're talking to, or whether it be um, what the value system, what the things that in their culture that are going on that are hindrances and all those kinds of things. Those are good to know. But when the cultural understanding has to be greater than the gospel understand. In other words, what he's saying is, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified among you. I wanted to live so close to Jesus Christ. This was my focus. This was my priority. Not lofty speech, not wisdom, not philosophy. My focus was not even on the problem, which is sin. You know, it wasn't on the problem. My focus was on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I wanted to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. You know what that also tells me? That also tells me that even in Corinth, a pagan place like Corinth, what Paul is, is indicating is that God was already at work among the people. In other words, Paul said, I didn't bring God's uh, Spirit with me. I didn't bring the work of God with me. I came to be involved with what the Holy Spirit was already doing in this pagan city with all of its turmoil. And even in the midst of all of this diversity, all the things that are going on in Corinth, I trusted that God had 
gone before. The Spirit was already there. God's grace was at work in people's hearts. And I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. I was discerning. I was working and seeking to find out what God was doing. Paul didn't study culture. He didn't study philosophy. He didn't study all these how-to kind of things, go all these seminars. He just said, I wanted to find out what God was doing among you and then get on board with it. My focus was Jesus Christ. The, the, uh, the subject that Paul embraced was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The second important thing that I would note is the style that he came with. The style. It says that he preached Jesus Christ. There's not a lot we know about Paul's preaching. Now, some people would say, you know, his, his, or the writing that, that we have of his letters, these epistles, like Corinthians, uh, would indicate his style of preaching. Some would disagree just because of what he's written and, and that, that he wasn't real uh, uh, great eloquent. He wasn't like what you would consider maybe a powerhouse preacher, if you will. Uh, but he preached Jesus Christ. Now, there's two components to that, uh, preaching Jesus Christ, all right? And uh, he kind of talks about that in here. I desire know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. My style was that he preached Jesus Christ so there's, there's both a positive and a negative side of this. And when I say negative, I mean um, how you go about it. Uh, the preaching Jesus Christ both is a subtracting of some things, but it's positive. So negatively, it's a subtraction of something, but positively, it's an addition of other things. So it's a subtraction. He said, I came to you with fear, trembling, weakness. I didn't come to you in whim- wisdom. But he said, but I did come in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so this is like this dynamic that he is telling you in in my style of preaching, it was not it was not powerful. I wasn't sending everybody's like, whoa, Paul, man, what a preacher. Whoa, Paul, how smart he is. Whoa, Paul, look at just physically, he's so tall and strong and muscular. Uh, no, he said, rather, I came with fear. I, I didn't know how you're gonna tell you. I came trembling. Uh, this message was bigger than I was, and I came in weakness and not not wisdom. But positively, he says. I came in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Uh, you know, I've noticed that there are not just in preachers, but in, in some, some, uh, in lots of different people, preachers and laity and alike, there are people who, who uh, will emphasize on that negative. They say, oh yeah, I, I identify with Paul and the fear, the trembling, the weakness. I don't, I'm not smart. I can't say things like other people say things. And so I identify with, with how he preached Christ negatively, but they never begin to identify with where, what he, the, his, his preaching Jesus Christ positively. When he says there came in the demonstration of the spirit and the power he talks in a negative weakness uh, intellectually uh, uh, he he didn't can't come like like one of the philosophers he wasn't just another philosopher he wasn't just another academic he came differently fear and trembling uh, not not fearfully but it's about God's presence being with him linked to these things. You know, I, I recognize that the great truth that I was bringing to the youth and the people of Corinth, the people that I was ministering to, was so significant that I was, I was sure that I could not do it justice in my own strength. And so I, was, I came in my weakness to you. But where we need to move to as, as God's people is, is to this place where we begin to, the, the, the positive aspect, not just of the weakness, the trembling, the fear, the I know wisdom, but come to the place where we have this demonstration of the Spirit and power. I uh, looked up the word demonstration uh, uh, with, uh, 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 in Webster Dictionary. It says an outward expression or display. An outward expression or display in other words he said demonstration of the spirit and power there were there was evidence of the work of God in what I was doing. I'm, I'm telling you, everything was working against me. I was one person walking into a pagan city with no allies except the Spirit of God. I was fearful. I knew I didn't come with wisdom. I couldn't compete with the philosophers of Greece. And yet I came with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. 
Uh, the spirit and the power are not separated. They're, they're linked here. There's the power of the spirit. The NIV says it this way, a demonstration of the spirit's power. The uh, Holman Christian Standard says, a powerful demonstration by the spirit. Power for what? Power for transformed lives. This is what the power is about. We get off on political power, all these other financial power, and, and uh, influence over other people, and the power of God that talks most evidently. Certainly he has all power in all things, and he can conquer. The, 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 the weakness of God is more powerful than the, the, than the strongest of men. And yet we get so consumed about all these other things when the real power is power of transformed lives. What was the demonstration there? The demonstration was that there were people who came to know Jesus Christ even in the fear, trembling, the lack of wisdom, uh, all the things working against Paul, yet the Spirit of God demonstrated its power through Paul in all of his weaknesses, in all of his frailty, in all of his shortcomings, demonstrated his his power to the world around them. He's talking about that. Can I just tell you that when you're doing something for Jesus Christ, there is power available to you in evangelism, in mission, in ministry day to day. When we talk about engaging the world for Jesus, all right, we're not saying we do it on our own. That's why we say we want to encounter God, be equipped by the Holy Spirit, and engage the world for Jesus. We go, yes, in our weaknesses. We go in our trembling. We go in our inadequacies. But we do not go alone when we go in the power of the Spirit. And there's a lot of people that do not believe that this, the power of the Spirit is able to work in their life. And so they miss out. They disregard. Uh, but I'm, I'm here to tell you the cross can turn repentance into spiritual victory. When people began to come to the cross of Jesus Christ, he was proclaiming Jesus Christ. That's what I want to know among you is Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him and what he's already doing among you. And if I can highlight what Jesus is doing and point you to him, and if you can come to the cross of Jesus Christ and repent of your sins, you can know spiritual victory through repentance. Hallelujah. The power of the cross is not that one day you'll be righteous and obedient. The power of the cross is that you can be right with God today. Hallelujah. That the Corinthians and all their paganness and all their sinfulness and all their brokenness and the, how far they were from God and how much they had misunderstood and how lacking they were even in biblical understanding and these spiritual truths and yet in all that the good news was that the power of God was available at that moment that they would humble themselves before Jesus Christ at the cross of, of Christ and turn from their sins they could know that the 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 living god and they could be righteous today not somewhere down the road but today you see when we can when we put off what god wants to do in the moment listen we are putting all of the work on our end in other words if i save myself it's going to be a process all right, because I've got to deal with the sins that I've committed. Oh, here's one. I'm going to deal with that one. I'm going to deal with this. One. Well, you can't deal with those things anyway, but the cross of Jesus can, and he deals with them all in a moment of time. It's just like the cleansing of our hearts and entire sanctification. It's the work of God that he does right now. And some of us, can I speak to you as your pastor, some of us, some of you are putting off God's work in your life. You say, well, I'm saved, or I'm sanctified, or maybe I'm neither, or whatever, but uh, maybe you are both saved and sanctified, but there are things that God is desiring to do today to uh, exhibit His power, to demonstrate His power, to change your life by, by aligning certain things in your life with His good and perfect will. Uh, see, I, I'm, I'm of the persuasion that delayed obedience is disobedience partial obedience is disobedience there's no such thing as future obedience god wants to do that work today today is the day that the lord wants to work he wants to demonstrate his power in your life for the world to see see there is a there is this false sense of humility that we can have sometimes. I like how Paul states it because he talks about the trembling. He talks about the weakness. He talks about his lack of wisdom, uh, the, at least on par with the, the philosophers of, of, of Greece. And, and, he, and he talks about those weaknesses, but he doesn't stop talking there. He talks boldly about the power of God. 
All right? So to go to one side or the other is, is to miss out, all right, uh, is, is really a, a false sense of pride. We tend to think pride being only on this extreme where we're bragging about what God's done. See, God, I, oh, God do this, or, you know, or, uh, or, and it really becomes more about what I've done than what God's done. But there's also this reverse kind of pride that is, that is about, well, you know, I, I can't do that. Uh, no, I'm not able. I, I'm, I'm not any good. I'm, I'm weak. I, you know, like Paul said, I'm trembling. I've got fear. I've got weakness. I've got, I don't have the wisdom that I need. And, and all those things may be true, but what you're doing is you're still placing your confidence in you rather than the power of God at work in your life. And it, I will tell you, there is a whole de depth of spiritual walking and living when we begin to experience the fullness of what God desires to do because we sit back and say, yes, I am weak. Yes, I have limitations. Yes, I have shortcomings. Yes, as a human being, being, uh, I, uh, I, I'm flawed and I have uh, limitations that I cannot overcome in my own strength. But I know that God wants to demonstrate His power through His Spirit in my life if I would yield to Him and allow Him to do these things. And I'm telling you, that's a whole nother uh, level of living that so many Christians never come to, realizing the power of God. Unrealized power I think is, uh, is the definition of dead religion. Unrealized power. We, we now stand some 2,000 years from the time of Jesus and His death and resurrection and His life and ministry here on earth. and uh, We have advanced technologically. We've ad advanced scientifically and in intellectually and our, uh, the, uh, not, the amount of knowledge that's available to us in so many ways. But uh, let me tell you something. We cannot advance in the area of the Holy Spirit's power outside of the work of His Spirit among us. We can't advance beyond the place where we don't need God's Spirit to do in our lives because there is moral decay. There is uh, defeat and, uh, and people bound up and people chained in their sin all around us. How many people, how, how many of you know that if you're a serial murderer, God wants you to stop it? Can I get an amen on that? If you're a serial myrtle, murderer, God wants you to stop it. But what if you are a serial liar? What if you just lie all the time? Don't you believe that God wants you to stop that too? What if, what if your problem is lust and that's a constant problem in your life? Don't you believe that God wants to put an end to that in your life? What if it's gossip? Don't you believe that the Spirit of God, the power of the living God, provided the cross of Calvary when He shed His blood to defeat all of sin and all of its form, don't you think God's grace and power is available to end pride in your life, you know, drug abuse, you know, your lack of faith, your worrying all the time? Don't you believe that God is able to break the chains of canceled sin if we would trust in Him? The subject is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The style is to preach Jesus. I want you to hear number three, the desired result. The desired result. He says uh, in, verse five, <clears throat> in verse 5, So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's interesting. He says that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men. Now, this could be an allusion to chapter 1 when he talks about the division that's in the church because some say, well, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow this and that, whatever, and they're all kind of divided. He could be kind of alluding to, to that, that, that reality or that problem in the life of the church. And he's like, I don't want your faith to rest. It doesn't need to rest in the wisdom of man. He could be alluding to the philosophers of the time and all the, all the knowledge of, of, uh, that they had and all the understanding and some of the academics of that time, that some of those even maybe that were in their ivory towers, he might be referring to them. Because I want you to understand here today, if your faith never gets beyond what you could do apart from Jesus anyway, then you will live a, uh, uh, and have a religion that is defeated and dead and in bondage. You will live in despair. You'll live in depression. You'll be discouraged all the time because you will keep coming up on the ends of your own strength and finding that it comes up short when there's something in your heart that is longing for more and the desired result. The desired result that Paul wants is not that they would rely upon his wisdom, not that they would rely upon the wisdom of the academics of the time, 
time. Not, not uh, on the wisdom of Hollywood or, or the culture around them or sage wisdom or even the wisdom of their parents or their relatives or their neighbors or some preacher somewhere along the way. But that they would move beyond the wisdom of men and their faith would be placed in the power of God at work in their life. Hallelujah. Some people live in defeat. They've spent years falling to the same thing. In fact, some of them maybe have never gotten, been able to get up off the ground. They've learned to deal with and live with this same area of defeat in their life. The devil's got a foothold in their life. He's not worried because as soon as they start to make a little bit of progress, all he's got to do is yank that, that fishing line back and he pulls them right back because he's got, he's got a collateral in their life. and in their, in their thing. Some of them, it's attitude. It's attitudes that aren't pleasing to the Lord. They don't build up the church. They don't build up others around them. It's just bad attitudes all the time. Maybe it's a complaining attitude. Maybe it's a whiny attitude. Maybe it's a discouragement attitude. Maybe it's just whatever it might be. It's an attitude that they've had all the way along. But I want you to know that there is uh, the power of the Holy Spirit can work to change and adjust attitudes. Hallelujah. Some of them it's baggage that they've carried for years over and over. They go back to that time where somebody hurt them. Somewhere along the way, some preacher did something to them. Somebody in the church looked at them funny. Something happened in their life and they're living in the misery of baggage that they keep on carrying with them. But I want you to know that the power of the Holy Spirit can work in your life and He can demonstrate His power by releasing you from the baggage. Hallelujah. All the hang-ups of life, He can release you from those things. The things that have hindered you for so long, the power of the Spirit can remove the hindrances. He can move the mountains. He can over help you overcome the barriers. He can help you conquer the obstacles. He can keep the end enemy on the run. Hallelujah. Trials will come and trials will go. And even in the life of Christians, the key is that we live in the victory. Stop the constant living in defeat on and on and on and on. It's the same thing over and over and over and over again. You just keep falling to it. In fact, it's not that you keep falling to it. You've never gotten up from it. It's a marriage troubles. It's gossip problems. It's fighting. It's attitudes. It's stress. It's worry. It's whatever it might be. And it's just you live there every day. You might have a day of peace here and there, and you say, well, I see I'm okay. I find I'm okay. But don't, don't, don't. It's just it's, there's a, a, a momentary pause in the midst of all the things that are going on. See, here's what I'm trying to say. It's okay to walk through spiritual wilderness, but it's not okay to live there. You can't live there. The norm for the life of the believer should be victory in Jesus Christ because the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us. The joy of the Lord, the abundant life ought to be the standard for us. Why do we settle for less than what God wants to do? Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's also not only the subject, but that's the style of the, the message. Your faith must rest, not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> I'm going to close with this. Uh, when, uh, when I was younger, I lived in a small uh, rural area in Kentucky, out in Pulaski County. Outside of Nancy was Naomi, and I lived out there and right behind our house. We didn't have much of a backyard because we had a chain link fence, and there was a cow pasture. And uh, often those cows, uh, the, the herd of cow will, cattle would come up, and they would graze there in the backyard. And, and, um, and one of the things that this, I know I was immature even as a teenager, uh, I, I, I like to do is go out the front door of the house and kind of sneak around to the edge of the house and then run that 10 feet or so right up to that chain link fence and kick it real hard where it, it clanged and made a lot of noise and all, the, all those cows would just scatter. They would go running and stampeding across that field. And I just thought that was so funny. I just thought that was hilarious that, uh, you know, little, little old me could get all those big old cows just running at full speed away from me. And I remember one day... Um, uh, some, uh, my dad saw me do it and uh, he got on to me about it and, and he said something along the lines of this he said son that, that cow one of those, just one of those cows if it wanted to could come right through that fence and get you that fence is not going to protect you from a mad cow you know, uh, 
yeah, that's kind of immature and that's kind of silly. But you know what? I think that's kind of what God's calling us to when it comes to spiritual matters. His call to you and I is, yes, I understand that just if one factor in life were to charge right at you, you have absolutely no power to overcome it. There's nothing you could do. But we're not charging the fence in our own power. We're charging the fence knowing that the presence of God is with us. Now today what I want you to do is we're going to open up the altar and I want you to consider what God desires to do in your life. Enough of defeat in the same place. Today is the day for victory to be had. Would you stand with me?